Hey there, comic fans. It's me, the Bullseye Bob, and welcome to an impromptu episode of Everything Comics on the Everything Comics channel. And um, uh, earlier in the week when I did my Comics with My Coffee video, uh, I did tell a few people uh, that I would be doing my origin video. And so I thought I'd just get together with you tonight and um, do the origin video. And what I mean by that is I'm going to basically tell you my story on how I got into comics and what actually hooked me uh, to become such a fan over the years and to love comic books the way that I do now. And so if you don't mind, just sit back and bear with me for a little bit because I'm going to tell you some personal history and uh, just to kind of build out uh, the story of how this happened and um, why it was so impactful to me to get into comic books. And uh, so thanks for tuning in. And uh, thanks for bearing with me for a little bit. But um, when I was really young in my family, um, we had a, a very tight family. We did everything together. Um, my mom was my best friend. And um, I used to kind of even used to stay home to, to take care of her because she was sick quite frequently. And uh, family get togethers were, you know, normal for most families. But we really did everything together. We did picnics. Uh, we got together at least once a week where everybody got together for cards and there were a lot of kids and uh, I really had a fun time growing up and my family was everything to me. And then my mom, when I was uh, 12 years old, uh, she passed away. Uh, she had a heart attack and um, it was just a uh, really devastating time. And some family dynamic things happened to me that I didn't quite understand. Of course, I understand them now. Um, but back then I didn't. And one of the things that uh, I quickly found out uh, was there are a lot of people in my family that had a, issues with my dad. And because of that, um, a lot of people stopped coming around after my mom uh, passed away. And uh, without people coming around, I, I'm starting to lose my family. Um, and the other thing, the other dynamic that I didn't realize when I was that age was that my mom was she was a matriarch. Uh, she was kind of uh, the head of the family. Everybody came to her for advice. Um, she's the one that kept everybody in line. Uh, you know, all families fight, but my mom was one of those that when family members would fight, she'd get them both in the same room and she'd sit them down and make them talk it out and so that we could go forward without any problems with each other. And so she kind of kept, she was the glue that kept the wheels turning in our family. And without her there to do that, uh, a lot of people fell apart from each other. And so here I am, 12 years old, and I started losing a lot of my family members. Family get-togethers stopped happening, and a lot of people just would not call my house. And um, so it started to become a very lonely time for a 12-year-old boy who's um, really having a hard time with the death of his mom and without a lot of people to, to, talk, to, you know, to talk to about it that were would have normally been my peers and people that I would have gone to. And um, so it was a very difficult time for me and, and I didn't understand it. And being 12, I'm starting you know, to get into that, that age when I was gonna go to junior high school. And um, so you know, I don't really have my family anymore and I'm kind of just feeling my way around, trying to fit in. I didn't know where I fit in at this point. You know, I, my family was everything to me. And here I am in these situations and circles with people I don't really know and wasn't really even sure about what I liked or disliked at this, at this age. And uh, so it was a very difficult time to, to traverse. And uh, it was a pretty lonely time as well. Um, I'm sure you all can relate that it can be very difficult um, for kids at that age, especially, you know, uh, I mean, everybody, you know, around that time is just trying to fit in. And um, I think it was even harder for me because I didn't have uh, any family to back on, uh, you know, to, to fall back on as well. And so, you know, here's this time where I'm, I'm kind of by myself. My dad was working a lot. Uh, so I was kind of a latchkey kid. And I used to go to the, the Venice, uh, I lived in Venice, California. I used to go to the Venice Boys Club a lot. And um, one of my, my rituals uh, that I used to get on the bus and go down to this place called Lincoln Pico News. Lincoln Pico News was great because it was a huge magazine stand and they had all kinds of magazines, uh, all kinds of periodicals. And of course, they also have comic books. Now at this time, 
I wasn't really into comic books. Uh, I'd always see them, uh, but I have to admit that I didn't really understand them or what the draw was to them. Most of my experience had been through um, kids uh, or my family buying books that were like Casper or um, uh, you know Archie comics or Casper. You know, and I already said Casper, um, uh, L Little Devil, and there was a few of them that were kind of comedic and more kid-like, and it didn't really appeal to me. But that was kind of my understanding of comics. And then I, I kind of knew Batman from cartoons. Uh, Superman and Wonder Woman from cartoons on on Saturday mornings and I knew they had come from comic books um, of course I was a huge fan of Batman 66 growing up I used to watch that religiously uh, but I never actually picked up a comic book um, and so uh, not a lot of experience there but Lincoln Pico News would have these rows and rows of all kinds of comics and so right about that time I had um, picked up uh, at a local bookstore, there was a book called Marvel Origins. And it appealed to me because um, with all those comic books on the stand, if I, even if I wanted to pick one up, which, what would I pick? Um, there was just so, so many to choose from. And I think even now, it, sometimes that can be very daunting for uh, new comic book, uh, you know, people just getting into comic books, like what to choose, what's a you know, stepping on point. Um, you know, you kind of need some help in the very beginning to, to you know, step into this. Uh, so I, I read Origins, and I, I really liked it. I can't say that it would, uh, it drove me to want to go buy comics, uh, but I got the origin stories of the Fantastic Four and Thor and the Hulk, and it was an introduction to those characters. I really enjoyed that book. And so about a year uh, after my mom passed away, um, you know, I was... Like I told you, I was going to the Venice uh, Boys Club. I was there all, every day after school. And then, of course, during the summertime, that was like my place to hang out. And so having a hard time fitting in there, having a hard time fitting in at school. And uh, so I started looking to, you know, for ways to, uh, to cope and to basically entertain myself. And uh, I think that's probably the first time I thought, you know, I'll go pick up one of those comic books. So I'm at Lincoln Pico News. And uh, the first book that I saw that appealed to me was Avengers number 57, that amazing cover all in red where you see the vision. And uh, I thought, man, that looks cool. And I, I picked it up and, I, and a couple other books. I don't even remember what those other books were. Um, but I remember specifically picking up that book because of the amazing cover that, that, would, you know, that it had. And uh, it was a good story. I can't say that uh, anything in the story would have made me want to buy another copy. Again, I wasn't into comics at the time. Uh, now when I read that story and I see how they introduce the vision, oh, I love it, absolutely love it. And it, it just pulls me right in. But back then, I was still on the fence. You know, I mean, most people didn't like tell everybody else you were somebody who read comics and most of the circles that I ran in. Uh, if you talked about comic books, that's a punishable offense. You get beat up because, uh, you know, that's what those those kids over there did. The nerds did and uh, the kind of the outcasts. And, you know, when, growing up where I grew up, you didn't want to be part of them. So I'm not telling anybody I'm, I'm doing this. Being at the Boys and Girls Club was one of those places that um, really helped me because at least I had a place to go to. I did have some friends, but I didn't have a group of friends or like I said, I, I really didn't fit in. But at the, the Boys and Girls Club, there was a counselor there. He was about probably, I don't know, seven or eight years older than I was. His name was Craig, Craig Wise. And uh, he was somebody that um, really genuinely cared about people. And he was somebody that, um, you know, when I was there, I, I, I could talk to. And I, I really enjoyed his company. Uh, and we became really good friends. And, you know, he would let me call. I'd, I'd call him up. And sometimes we'd talk on the phone for, for a couple hours. Uh, he was somebody who was older than me uh, that I could just basically be myself and talk about anything with. And he, ne he never judged me. And I really appreciate that, appreciated that about Craig. Um, so, yeah, it's around this time, you know, uh, a month after I got that first comic book that Avengers number 58 came out. And um, so this is what happened. I'm reading this book. And if you don't know the story uh, in the first uh, part of the story where they introduce Vision in Avengers 57, um, the Vision comes on the scene. He attacks the Avengers. 
um, you know, he shows his power set, he's pretty powerful. And then it comes down to, hey, wait, why are you attacking us? And then he starts to think, well, why am I attacking you? And it's very apparent that somebody's controlling him or planted um, uh, thoughts in his mind about taking out the Avengers. And so he kind of goes on a journey of how that got there and who he is, because he really doesn't even know who he is at this point. And uh, through a series of events that go through into the second book, they find out that he was created by Ultron to specifically destroy the Avengers. And after they understand that, then they start getting into, uh, you know, how he was created. Uh, there was a character called Wonder Man, uh, and Wonder Man died, but his consciousness, Hank Pym uploaded his consciousness just in case he could be revived at any point. They'd still have the consciousness of, I can't remember the character's actual name, but it was Wonder Man. And uh, so Vision took that consciousness and created an android uh, that was specifically designed to kill the Avengers, and that's how the Vision was created. And um, through a, a couple of series of fights, the Avengers learned that they can trust him. And so here he is at the end of the book, and he's about to leave, and the Avengers basically said, um, you know, don't leave. Um, we would like to invite you to become one of us. And... There's this moment where the vision kind of turns away and says, I'll be back in a moment. And as he does that, Iron Man says, you know, as he's walking away, I, I kind of detect there was some sentiment there, which is kind of baffling. And I think it was Goliath turns to him and says, don't you know uh, that even an android can cry? And they show this panel. Wow, if I get emotional, that's whew. Um, they show this panel of Vision with his head in his hand, and he's got a tear falling down. Wow, I didn't think I was getting emotional, guys. Sorry. Um, so basically, um, at that point, <clears throat> here's this inanimate robot object um, with the consciousness, and he understands what it means uh, to the core of his being, uh, uh, what it means to fit in or to be accepted. So much so that something that shouldn't cry is moved to tears. And I remember, wow, <laughs> I remember me being, you know, 12 or 13, uh, that it, it, it touched me. I mean, it really resonated with me. And I think the, the main reason why it resonated with me was because somebody out there knew what I was going through. They understood the importance of what it meant to fit in. And, um, you know, so I, I, I wasn't expecting to be, you know, emotionally moved by this book. And um, I remember later that day, I called up Craig, you know, because I pretty much talked to Craig about everything. And uh, I got to tell him how excited I was about this comic book. And, and, but before I was excited, I was kind of like sheepish because I never really told him I was reading comic books. It was like, again, that was kind of the thing you didn't do. And, uh, so I kind of said, you know, it was kind of, kind of cool today. I got, I got, the, I picked up a comic book and it, it really touched me. And he said, oh yeah, tell me about it. And I, I start telling him the story and I get to the end of the book because I'm, I'm reading it while I'm over the phone with him. And, um, and so I, I get to that line and I, and I said, don't you know? And then right when I said the final line, Craig, on the other end of the line, repeated it back to me in unison while I was saying it to him, don't you know even an android can cry? And I'm like, wait a second, you know this? And he's all, yeah, that's one of my, my favorite comic books of all time. Well, boom, he, first of all, didn't know he was a comic book reader, so that was a revelation. But second of all, it's like this book just came out onto the stand that day, I mean, they just put it out. How could he know it by heart? How could it be one of his favorite comic books of all time? And I'm like, this thing just came out. How, how, how do you even know this? He's all, that didn't just came out. He said, what you have in your hand is a reprint. He said, that book came out about 10 years ago and, um, and back in, in 1968. And it was one of my, my favorite uh, copies of Avengers of all time. I've read it so many times that I, I know it by heart. And I'm like, what? And from that point, Craig and I had this three-hour conversation about comic books. And this whole new world was opened up to me. He told me about 
stuff in DC and how that original Batman 66 uh, 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 series had nothing to do with the actual comic books, but that there was this whole other thing going on that he knew that I would love. He told me about The Flash. He told me about every single Marvel character that there was, and I had so many questions. I didn't know that you could be this deep into comics and that they were that cool. And um, I'll never forget that night because it was just like, again, a whole new world was opened up to me. And so after we talked about it, of course, you know, I'm excited to go to the newsstand the next day and get some more comics. And, um, you know, every comic that I read, it, it led me into the next one and the next one. Because as you know, the, you know, a lot of these, the way they're set up, you'll read a comic book and then you'll see this character appear. Or you'll get the, the, uh, the piece inside of the book where it says, uh, you know, this happened in issue so-and-so. So you say to yourself, well, I got I to gotta see where that came from. I got to read about what happened there. I got to read about this character. And so... Uh, I started buying more and more comics, and the more I dived into it, the more I just absolutely loved it. And, uh, of course, back then, uh, you had the amazing, amazing foresight of Stan Lee uh, to make sure that in the comic books, he talked to the readers in such a way that made them feel like they were part of something bigger that was kind of like a secret, like you were in on the secret, and um, but also that you you were part of this huge... Uh, fan base the, that were the Merry Marvelites and that you knew something that everybody else didn't. And uh, you know, I was hooked. I was hooked and I, I couldn't get enough of it. I went on to um, you know, get into a lot of different characters from there. But um, you know, I have never stopped being a comic book fan ever since that day. Uh, there's times where I've had to let it go for a while and, and walk away, but I've always, always come back. It's always given me so much entertainment. It's always uh, brought me so much joy, and um, I could talk comics, you know, all day long. Um, and as a matter of fact, I invite you to do that. You know, sometime if you're in Portland and um, you hit me up and you want to go have coffee or let me know that you're going to be at the Refuge or any other local coffee shop, and I'll come meet you. We'll talk about comics, hang out. I love it. So here I am all these years later, and uh, I have to tell you, the guys that created comic books were they, they were my heroes. I'm kind of like Brian Michael Bendis. You ever listened to some of his interviews? Um, he, growing up, he was the guy that when he looked inside the comic book and it said penciled by, or it said colored by, or it said written by, those names uh, that they brought up, those were his heroes. And it was the same with me. Uh, the comic creators became my rock stars, and I just loved the content that I was getting. But this book, uh, Avengers number 58, um, the one that, that, that touched me this way was written by Roy Thomas. Uh, of course, you all know Roy Thomas, one of the greatest uh, comic book creators of all time. He's done so many different things. Of course, as you know, he is responsible for creating Wolverine. Uh, and of course, just you know the story that I just told you, he created the Vision. And then, of course, he did Carol Danvers, who we now know to be uh, Captain Marvel. And uh, then we got... He did Luke Cage, Iron Fist. He's the one who co-created them. And, you know, a man thing. I know man thing is kind of like a, a rip of swamp thing, but he's the guy who did it. And uh, then we got Red Sonja. I always thought Red Sonja was part of the Conan world, but Red Sonja was actually created by Roy Thomas. Fun fact. And then, you know, Ghost Rider is another one. Valkyrie. He's created all these characters. And then, uh, you know, he was also the guy that was responsible for bringing uh, Star Wars to, to Marvel Comics. And he was also the guy responsible for bringing Conan there. Uh, and so he's got a lot of accolades. Uh, right now, uh, he's uh, on the board for the Hero Initiative. Of course, they uh, do a lot of things for um, out-of-work artists or artists in the industry who have retired because they have no benefits. The Hero Initiative uh, gets, uh, buys health care for him and things like that. So anyway... He's an amazing guy, and I've always wanted to meet him. I mean, he wrote this story that touched me uh, so very deeply, and, and uh, so he became, uh, you know, an absolute hero of mine, and, uh, you know, he's very rare that he's ever come out to the West Coast, so I never thought, you know, that I would actually meet him. Um, and just this last year, guys, uh, he, it was announced that he was coming to the Washington uh, State Summer Con. And as soon as I found out that he was going to be there, not only was he going to be there, but they offered a special 
uh, meet and greet. You could, you know, pay, pay a premium, and after the uh, the show that day, you got to actually sit with Roy Thomas. I was first in line. I bought that hands down because I knew I wanted to meet him. I wanted to shake his hand. I wanted to tell him so much. Uh, thank you uh, for um, this particular comic, in particular, Avengers number fifty-eight, and how much it touched me and how much it it it, it really changed my life. And um, so I got a chance to do that, guys, and and. Uh, so I ended up getting um, Avengers number 58. Um, you know, I mean, I know everybody goes for 57, and that's great. There's nothing wrong with that book. But this one holds a very special place in my heart. And I got to meet him. Of course, he signed it. And um, I got to, you know, explain my story to him and uh, tell him how much I appreciate him. And one of the cool things is that he told me that this story, even in Android Can Cry, well, um, was one of the first stories he ever wrote with the ending in mind. Normally, he doesn't do that. He would form his stories from beginning to end, but he knew that he wanted to write that story um, with that punchline at the end, even an android can cry. And I saw, like, well, you punched me because uh, my heart was being definitely affected, you know, for the rest of my life. And uh, But it was just so cool to be able to tell him that, to be able to meet him, to hang out with him for a minute. And uh, I was... I, I felt like I was that 13-year-old boy and um, got a chance to meet just a true legend and a hero. Um, you know, I think some of these comic creators and artists are very much underappreciated. You know, nothing against Stan Lee. Stan Lee deserves every accolade, and I loved him so much. But I would say that, that Roy Thomas is every much as important to comics as Stan Lee ever was. And uh, just to get a chance to be able to meet him and let him know uh, how much I appreciate him. Um, it just meant uh, meant the world to me. And so, yeah, it was, it was awesome, guys. It was, it was kind of weird because I almost never made up idols before I wrote the story, but in this case I did, so that's why John was able to carve it into the title and everything. I don't know, I just, for some reason, I was just sitting there, I was thinking I knew what, how the story was going to end, so I just said I was going to call the story that. Usually I didn't title a story until I started writing the dialogue afterwards. I just felt even an Android surprise was kind of a nice because, you know, One of the greatest comics ever. Ever. Well, ever. Oh, of course. That's so, it. I like it so much. The title's good, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is, this the is, art was nice. This is that comic. So. This is that comic. Was well, that yours? No, no. no. I, I, I originally read it in a reprint. Didn't even know what a reprint was. Oh, yeah, yeah right. Yeah, you can't tell. Yeah, exactly. But anyway, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm this, flattered, obviously. Though. This is a reprint. Yeah. But if you could on this... And um, you know, so here I am today. Um, I'm 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 53 years old. Uh, a huge comic book fan. Of course, now I have this this you know YouTube show where I get to do you know what I love and, and talk about comics. Um, and you know, I, I hope that that comes out. You know, my absolute passion. But that's where it started. And um, of course, you know, here I am. You know, so many years later. Uh, you know, I found out recently that, you know, because Craig and I had fallen out a long time ago, um, you know, not not in a bad way. Uh, we just kind of separated from each other. But I found out recently that he passed away. And um, I just have to say that I really miss him. He was a good friend. And uh, he introduced me to this amazing world of comics and gave me a stepping on point. Uh, he truly was a good friend. And uh, so... That's it, folks. That's my story. That's my original story. That's how, how Bob got into comics. And uh, I'd like to hear how you got into comics. Was there an event inside of your life that absolutely hooked you? Uh, was there an event or, or, or was it something you just picked up and then you slowly, gradually uh, just knew that you can never put it down? I mean, I'd love to hear your story. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much for listening. I appreciate, appreciate you guys very much. And uh, hey, stay tuned this weekend uh, for... Uh, having comics with my coffee on Saturday. Uh, I'm going to have Bueller is going to be a guest on the show. And uh, we got a lot of great things in store. So stay tuned, folks. Hey, do me a favor. If you like the content that I'm, I'm bringing up, hit the like and subscribe button. And uh, just do me a favor and say, hey, thank you guys. Have a great night. And Excelsior.